Kitty, remember, if you do weird stuff when you do a South Park video, your YouTube career is over. Just review. Oh, hey, Kyle. Uh, hey, dude. What are you doing here? Helping my dad pick out some cool new power tools. What are you doing? Helping my dad give people fake tickets. Well... Wait, should I do it? Okay. Well... Eh, screw it. Well... Kyle's dad is a... Okay then. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk and I'm here to talk to you about South Park. Or more specifically, Gerald Broflosky, Kyle's dad, and also Ike's dad, because Ike is sometimes there too. Apparently the boys' names are a pun, I will let you decipher on your own time. Now, I've been pretty vocal and upfront about the fact that I am not Gerald's biggest fan, especially because of his actions in the Troll Tray season, where he makes a big mess, a global mess, gets his sons in trouble trouble involved and nearly ruins the world just so he can be an a-hole to people on the internet and not get in trouble with his wife. And why does he want to be on the internet harassing people? Because it's funny. And because I'm a content creator and have to deal with Gerald's on a daily basis, he now sucks even harder for me. However, that's not to say I've always hated Gerald. Outside of Troll Trace, I'm willing to tolerate him. He wasn't always like this and he still still had his respect. The thing is, something I've realized on rewatches, he was a bad person, even back then. He just never really let it get in the way of being a good father, and compared to the rest of the South Park fathers, he was normally pretty decent in comparison. Usually. So, let's discuss. As previously stated, Gerald is a main character in the world of South Park. He works as a lawyer, but because South Park is a small mountain town. I don't think he's one specific kind of lawyer, right? Do all lawyers have to be like one thing? At times, he does use his profession for good, such as in Chef Aid, where he tried to defend Chef against the record company who stole his song, Stinky Britches. Oh, in summation, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've heard the exact same song produced by these cheats in the past month. I'd say it's pretty much an open and shut case. Make the right decision. And while his defense was pretty good, the thing was, he just had the misfortune of going up against Johnny Cochran of all people, and his infamous Chewbacca defense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Chewbacca. Chewbacca is a Wookiee from the planet Kishik, but Chewbacca lives on a planet Endor. God, uh, Mr. Cochran, uh, look, one thing, uh, just one little thing. Chewbacca was never from Endor. He just visited there during the rebellion. I don't even like Star Wars that much and even I know that. Your whole argument does not make since. FYI, Gerald, you're a lawyer. Because you didn't notice this, you're a horrible lawyer. This would have destroyed his entire argument. No wonder Chef almost went to prison. Early on, Gerald was often examined under a microscope, especially during the episode Chicken Pox, where we discover his former friendship with Stuart McCormick. These episodes I did really enjoy because they made him seem more human, not perfect. To some degree, Gerald deserves how he acts because, unlike Stewart, he had ambitions. He wanted to be a lawyer. He wanted to make something of himself. And you know why? Because your dad's Jewish. That ain't why, Stuart. It's because you are an alcoholic and he had dreams of not eating frozen waffles for dinner every night. And he achieved his dream by going to a community college. I wasn't lucky. You had rich parents. You got to go to that expensive community college. Hey! I worked my ass off to get to where I am today. I wanted to be somebody. See, community college isn't awful, nor is it that one show Dan Harmon did before Rick and Morty. It is a viable solution. However, this isn't to say I totally agree with Gerald. It seems like Gerald forgot about his roots considering his viewpoints on gods versus clods. Because Kenny's family doesn't have as much money as we do. But why? If they're hungry and poor, why don't we just always give them half of our food? <laughs> oh boy, have you got a lot to learn. Which part of me sees as he probably doesn't want to tell Kyle the full extent of why he doesn't hang out with Stuart. Kyle is a child, after all. Ah, oh, that rhymes. Stuart's son is one of Kyle's best friends. Stuart is the type of person where even if you probably gave him the solution to his problems, he wouldn't accept it because it's just easier for him to wallow. Because I have a slightly higher intellect than others. 
but I still need people to pump my gas and make my french fries and fix my laundry machine when it breaks down. So Kenny's family is happy just the way they are. And there is a possibility that this entire chat could ruin his friendship with Kenny. Besides, you learn all those juicy family gossip details in high school at the earliest. Still, while the episode has the parents trying to purposefully infect their children with the chicken pox virus because of some misguided idea of helping them, I already talk about that way too often, more than I probably should, because Gerald had his own subplot with Stuart going on a fishing trip together. The best you can say about him this time around is he was the only parent not involved in the plot. Still, while we're on the subject of Gerald's childhood, I kind of want to go on a little tangent. Just a little one. During It's a Jersey thing, we learned that Sheila is from Jersey, specifically from Nork, the home base of me and Tunerific Tariq. No, we don't know each other. Not all YouTubers know each other in real life. Sheila, who are you talking to? You wouldn't understand. It's a Jersey thing. Still, I have questions. In Jersey, Sheila was known for being a wild party girl, and then she married Gerald. Eventually, the pair moved in with her parents, likely because Jersey is either super expensive as heck, or in Nork, speaking from experience, you live with your parents or a short distance away from them, like down the street or around the block. Then, when Sheila got pregnant with Kyle, they moved back to Gerald's hometown of South Park. We knew we had to get out. Neither one of us wanted a child to be from Jersey. So we moved as far away as we could. Well, that episode explored Kyle's Jersey side and sort of did the same with Sheila until she disappeared like halfway through for some reason. It never really explores the possible Jersey side of Gerald, if there even was one. Did he move to Jersey for school or work or an internship until he got sucked into the terrible, horrible worlds of living down the shore? Did he hate living in Jersey but love Sheila so much that he just put up with it? Trey and Matt, I need a backstory episode. Or at least a fanfic or some fan art. I'm not picky. Back to the video. This mini downfall streak, well, begins properly in season three, where he uses his lawyer powers for evil. In his first truly despicable episode, Sexual Harassment, Panda Petey, the titular sexual harassment panda, comes to explain to third graders what sexual harassment is and why it's bad. That makes me a sad panda. This is freaking me out, dude. Which part of me feels is weird, but then again, this is also the kind of school where kindergartners have to learn how to properly put on rubbers. Kerbman only sort of understands the gist of what Petey is saying and believes he is being sexually harassed. Uh-oh. What? You have sexually harassed me for the last time. It says right here that now I can sue you and take all of your money. That's right, he can. So he sues Stan for constantly calling him a name. A. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, you know I have to censor it. But I think you know, bleep or not, why it's so bad. Cartman's lawyer, of course, is... Dude, he got a lawyer? Sorry I'm late. Dad? Oh, hi, Kyle. Oh, it's cute how he greeted Kyle, like he was at a bake sale or something. Other than that, betrayal. Wait, is it? Lawyers don't always choose who to defend. They often have to do their jobs. Maybe Gerald was a public defender or just helping out a family friend who likely couldn't afford a lawyer otherwise. I do always try to see the good in people. Mayhaps Gerald had good intentions until he turned into a complete and total big fat meanie. Or maybe he's just a greedy scum bucket who profits off of a striped, stretchy, insecure clown that sounds like Beetlejuice on Sudafed. Sorry, I can't get hell of a boss out of my bonnet. As expected, Gerald wins the case for Cartman, somehow. And as restitution, Cartman gets half of Stan's stuff, because they're both children. Hooray! Since the defendant is underage and has no monetary resources, it is the judgment of this court that 50% of Stan Marsh's belongings are to be handed over to Eric Cartman immediately. What are they doing? Forcing. Still, while well, Cartman is content to just take Stan's crap because, you know, he's a bully and likely also poor so he doesn't have any of that stuff himself, Gerald has higher aspirations. You know, the people really responsible for your harassment is the public schools because they're the ones that let this harassment go on. 
And they have a lot more money. I think we could get a lot more out of this than half of Stan's belongings. Gerald, if it's money you're after, I have the perfect client for you. Laura Vanderboobin. Wait, wrong show. Instead, Gerald intends to go after the school for not preventing the abuse. Which includes Garrison, who honestly deserves to at least get scolded if this is how he acts in court. You are the witness here, Mr. Garrison, not Mr. Hat. I'm sorry, Tuds. I'll deal with you another day. I have stuff to say about you, but I will deal with it another day. And Principal Victoria. All right, all right, I killed him. I hit him over the head and I cut up the body. I tried to burn it, but it wouldn't burn. I had to do it. <laughs> oh, God! Okay, maybe her becoming a harbinger against the ads doesn't seem so crazy as it did when it first happened. Really, they need to bring her back. Once again, and Gerald wins and gets Cartman $1.3 million. Which, after you calculate legal fees, taxes, all that jazz, is likely way less than $1.3 million. Legal experts have read it, how much would it really be? Gerald doesn't care that he's hurting people because he has money. Schools have lots of money. You see, we all pay taxes, and part of that tax money goes to public schools. And it's from that money that we got our $1.3 million. And you don't see a problem with that? No. Wow, he really is Mammon. Wait, am I allowed to make that joke? Okay, he's like Mr. Krabs. Wait, is that joke even worse? Much like chicken pox, Kyle disagrees with his father's viewpoint, despite how much he keeps trying to import it onto him. It's a very fragile system that nature has designed. All things flow into each other. You're trying to confuse me now, aren't you? Sort of, yeah. Ooh, I'm telling Sheila, you defrauded the school system. Thanks to these constant lawsuits, South Park Elementary starts to suffer unjustly. They don't have any more money for teaching tools, and at one point, they're forced to lay off Petey, the sexual harassment panda. I'm afraid we're just going to have to let you go. I'm a sad panda. Irony. It was sexual harassment that did him in. The only person who ever wins in these conflicts is Gerald, or Kyle's dad, per the episode. Then call me, Kyle's dad. I knew I needed legal help. Kyle's dad helped me get a $1.6 million settlement. Kyle's dad got me $1.4 million. Not gonna lie, I do appreciate the little running gag of people calling other people's parents by their titles rather than their actual names. Like Kyle's mom, Craig's mom. I don't know, it makes it seem more realistic and it always manages to make me giggle. This girl touched my thigh. Half her belongings. School is sued for $2.1 million. We're ruined! Next! Fine. Finally, we get Gerald's crowning achievement, which will likely bankrupt the entire town, like they landed on the whammy space, but make Gerald himself filthy stinking rich. The everyone versus everyone case. Representing the side of everyone is Gerald Braflowski. Representing the side of everyone else is Gerald Braflowski. So whatever the outcome, things look very bright for Kyle's dad. You know, I'm surprised this actually made it to court, but I guess we do need to satire stuff. You know, I gotta say, for as bad as Gerald was here, at least he did not waste everybody's time and energy with suances later on. I'm really surprised he wasn't the lawyer in that episode, considering how he was a victim of the Toilet Safety Administration. The best part about this episode is how Gerald's downfall came about. Gerald believes it's fine to do all this because he can manipulate the system. These laws tell us what we can and can't say in the workplace, and what we can and can't do in the workplace. Do you understand? Do you? Just look at how big this house is, Kyle. Hubris. Since his actions apparently did nothing but encourage sexual harassment, or rather, lawsuits for sexual harassment, Petey exiles himself to the Island of Misfit Mascots. Island of Misfit Mascots Commune. This must be the place. Oh god, please tell me there isn't a creepy CGI hippo there. However, the boys are able to convince him to return to town by saying that the problem was his focus. But now you need to teach a new message. What message? That people shouldn't sue each other all the time. You know, you little cubs might just be right. So rather than talk about sexual harassment, he becomes Petey, the don't sue people panda. He's a whole new panda now. Hello everyone, I'm Petey the don't sue people panda. Hey! 
We don't take kindly to folks that don't sue people around here. Then he is able to convince the townsfolk that, well, yeah, sexual harassment sucks. So, May, you should only sue if the case is actually justified. Because that money does have to come from somewhere. From the schools, from taxes, from the state, from you. There's no such thing as free money. And that makes me a sad panda. And also, BT Dub, Gerald is a money grubbing weirdo who wears green and scams people and is also greedy. And more Mammon references. This is all that damn lawyer's fault. Yeah, let's sue the lawyer! Yeah! So he ends up getting sued for a change and loses everything he worked so hard to- Boy, what a great message he has! Well, I've really learned something today. All I could see was the millions of dollars coming to me- Well, I'm no longer doing sexual harassment lawsuits in schools! The thing is, in the earlier seasons, as we saw, Gerald wasn't that bad of a guy, despite the occasional episode. True, he was basically Mammon if Mammon was a lawyer, but when you compare him to, say, Steve and Chris or Randy, he wasn't that particularly bad, just a little more realistic, which can normally be a bad thing in a show as zany as this, but I didn't particularly mind, because his appearances were so few and far in between. And, like I've probably repeated enough already, he'd either get what was coming to him, or he just seemed like a nice guy who lost his way. Besides this, the worst you could say is he and Randy experimented in a hot tub, owned by Mr. Mackey. No hot tub for me! Well, screw you guys! I'm getting in for a while too! Geronimo! Then he acted like a jilted lover, which was pretty funny. You didn't tell anybody, did you? Well, a, a few people, yeah. What? Why the hell would you do that? You didn't say not to tell anyone. Well, of course I thought it would be implied. Listen to you. You're yelling at me. You've never yelled at me before. Ugh! Or he dropped his sons and Kenny, who's not Jewish, off at Jew Scouts, which admittedly seems a little better than just locking them in a basement with the Melvins. At least they would spend the night doing something fun. Then again, he did make his eldest son lie to the other. No, tell like how much fun Squirts is, Kyle. What? You want me to lie? Yeah, lie. Oh. OMG, how awful. But he did let Kenny go to Jubilee with them, provided he lie and say that he was Jewish, which obviously wasn't hard. Please, Ma, I don't think Kenny has anywhere else to be tonight. Oh, alright, just don't let any of the elders know that he isn't Jewish, okay? Woohoo! Then we got the later seasons, where Gerald went the way of a more realistic Steve and Chris. The first time this happened was arguably during one of his more normal parenting moments. Presenting the Wacky Molestation Adventure, where he and Sheila lie to Kyle. Kyle wants to go to a concert with his friends, but Gerald and Sheila refuse because Kyle isn't old enough. No, Kyle. But all the guys are going! Kyle, you're not old enough and those concerts are dangerous and vile. So go with him. Kyle won't stop begging, so eventually they just tell him he can go. If, and only if, he accomplishes all of these Herculean trials. But what if I do a bunch of chores around the house? Come on, you're being unfair! Alright, fine, Kyle. You can go to the concert if you clean out the garage, shovel the driveway, and bring democracy to Cuba. Do it, Kyle. I'm Cuban, and also Afro-Latina. Do it for me. Obviously, Gerald and Sheila don't really mean it. It's their way of saying, you can go when pigs fly. Or, we're just too polite to tell you to quit whining. But, they forgot that Kyle happens to live in South Park, and rubs elbows with dictators and dangerous world leaders on a daily basis. So Kyle writes a letter to Fidel Castro himself, wonder how he found his address, politely asking him to free Cuba from oppression. Todos junto. This does mark the end of communism in Cuba. Cuban dictator Fidel Castro claims he was finally convinced by a young boy's letter. Oh, that's all it takes? Kyle, we need you and your letter writing skills nowadays. Speaking of, didn't they have a Golden Girls episode where Rose wrote a letter to the leader of Russia during the height of the Cold War and the letter reaches national attention because they think she's a little girl? I wonder if they got the episode from that. Still, upon finding out Kyle did what the UN only dreamed of doing, Sheila and Gerald still refused to allow him to attend the concert. You weren't supposed to actually do it. 
But I did. I, I brought democracy to Cuba. We know, Kyle, but we just don't want you going to their concert. You lied to me. Kyle, perhaps we handled this wrong. Wow, okay, this is complicated. Now, I do understand it from both ends, but because this is a Gerald video, we're primarily sticking with Gerald and Sheila. Maybe it's a tad easier for them than just telling Kyle, because I said so. Which, as a parent, I suggest you don't say, because that gets you nowhere. Just saying exactly why you can't do it is how you show a child you respect them. But Kyle still did a great thing. He should be getting a Nobel Peace Prize for. Even if you weren't gonna let him go to the concert, you can always compromise. Why not tell him, Kyle, you can't go to the concert, but you can have anything else that you want. Maybe he can go to Casa Bonita on Saturday and take all of his friends. Or he can get that toy he really wants. Or, you know, a Nobel Peace Prize. Because what he did is like nigh impossible. Like, you gotta give him a little credit, seriously. This, of course, leads into the infamous false molestering plotline, with Gerald and Sheila being the first victims. What about my children? Who will take care of them? Oh, now you care? They're going to live with their grandmother. Their grandmother's been dead for three years! Ah, oh, that's a good callback. Cleo Broflowski, rest in peace. Good thing they learned their lesson in prison, and now they can spend the rest of their lives trying to make it up to their children for all of the abuse they inflicted upon them. Wait, what? I mean, at least it's an improvement. But we're all better now. But you didn't do anything to me. Uh, we did. We've come to terms with it through therapy and learned to admit it. It won't happen again. And Kyle did get to go to that concert he really wanted to go to. But this is where we start to see Gerald evolve more and more. In Mr. Garrison's fancy new pink face, Gerald learns that Mr. Garrison transitioned into Janet. And he is pissed. Oh my god. That does it. I'm taking you boys out of that school. Gerald seems like a weirdly prophetic man, which I don't side with his views. Just something I've noticed on rewatches. Hopefully when the show comes back, they do another banned book episode. Or a Karen school board episode, because I would love to see what they would say. Granted, the only thing I side with him on this episode is the thing with the doctor. While I have no problem with the fact that the doctor helped Garrison transition, even if the circumstances as to why Garrison transitioned were kind of odd, I do have a problem with the dolphin thing. And turning Kyle into to a black man. Wait, I'm sorry. Making them look like dolphins and black men, not actually turning them into dolphins and black men. My mistake episode. Neither really got the option to live life as their chosen species or race or whatever. What, they can't supply Gerald with dolphin hormones? And the doctor did not think to warn them there would be actual negatives. I mean, he kinda did at the beginning of the episode with Garrison. God bless you, doctor. I know you'll make me well again. Now, you're absolutely sure- Gerald, I am not in favor of frivolous lawsuits, but this is one of those times I feel like it could be its own episode. You should have put your lawyer skills to work. Still, Gerald signs his name on the dotted line and lives out his dream of becoming a dolphin, one of the most majestic and ash of all creatures. Look at what one of them did to Hank Hill and Bill Dotrieve and that golfer dude who harassed Luann. That doctor is a miracle! Worker, Sheila. I'm the happiest I've ever been. Look, Ike, your daddy's a dolphin. Gerald, please don't tell me you were that one dolphin from King of the Hill. No wonder Ike was terrified of you. Still, Gerald transitions back at the end because status quo, so maybe he learned not to harass trans people. I don't know. What was the lesson here? While we're on that subject, Gerald's idiocy gets the spotlight in Night of the Living Homeless, one of my favorite episodes. Unfortunately, Gerald becomes homeless, despite having his own home. All because of some issues with Change. There! There's some change! Alright, a little bit! There you go! Take the change! Oh wait! Wait, now I don't have any change left for the bus! What, are you too lazy to just walk home and get some change there? Maybe you do deserve to have to march all the way from Colorado to California just to learn your lesson. Okay, on that note, we finally got to the episodes y'all probably wanted me to talk about. The ones where Gerald is truly despicable and belongs in the lowest pit of hell. First on the agenda, we have Smuggler. OMG, I hate this episode. Just because of that one game. 
gag. We're a little more progressive and ahead of the curve here in San Francisco. Yeah, not really a fan of fart jokes. Gerald has bought a hybrid car back when it was cool to buy a hybrid. I just, I just couldn't sit back and be a part of destroying the earth anymore. Well, good for you. Oh, thanks. Pish posh. Nowadays, it's all about electric cars. My family has one. We rent it. And he goes around town rubbing his new hybrid in everybody's face like it's a new chihuahua. The emissions from a vehicle like yours causes irreparable damage to the ozone. I drive a hybrid. It's much better for the environment. Thanks. Something tells me that Gerald and Brian Griffin would get along just fine, except for the religion side of things. Feeling like he is now living amongst the peasants because they drive gas guzzlers, even if I'm sure they only drive them because that's all they can afford, not because they hate the environment. Being Gerald, he instead decides to take his family the California way to San Francisco. I've talked it over with your mother and We've decided to move! What? We need to be where everyone is motivated and progressive like us. Ugh, of course he would seek shelter in the most genified, expensive part of an already genified, expensive state. Beforehand, Kyle and his brother try to tell Gerald to lay off to no avail. Feel that your new car is changing you. Yes, it certainly is. We're thinking that a lot of people in town are starting to... Take offense! are starting to take offense at your actions. Kyle, I weep for you. Your father's a Ken. When they get to San Francisco, they find out that everybody there is basically Gerald, but avocado toast worse. This is a house. Oh, hello there. You must be the new neighbors. You in here, Peter? Oh, hey, Paul. Come on in and meet the Brothloskis. Hello there. How intrusive. Sorry, right, that's my one pet peeve I have about shows that introduce new neighbors. Like, I get wanting to be welcoming, but they're in the process of moving in. They're probably stressed. They probably traveled a long way. And they probably just want to relax. Give them more than two seconds before you spring on them like a hungry spider monkey. Oh, and because of the combined smug, Gerald causes San Francisco to be covered in a giant smug cloud, which nearly kills him and his entire family. If it gets hit by George Clooney's acceptance speech, it will be a disaster of epic proportions. The perfect storm of self-satisfaction. And causes Cartman, who is already suffering from not having Kyle around to torment, having to go into the heart of the smug cloud and rescue the Broflaskis before it takes San Francisco off the face of the earth. It's about that yet. Being smug is a good thing. Oh my Christ! Oh god, you know you've done effed up when freaking Eric Cartman has to go and bail out your behind. Then there's Major Boobage, which feels like a weirdly cautionary tale in one of my favorite Gerald episodes. Huffing Cat Pee, aka Cheesing, has become all the rage amongst the South Park students. Yes, poor Mr. Kitty, are you just so upset right now? Bring out the other male cat. Ew! Like, I know there's lots of ways to do it, but do you really need to do it like that? That's so gross. Plus, my avatar is a cat, but I'm not a furry. Is somebody gonna try to make me mad just to get high? I can't live with that guilt. Well, it's, it's not actually cat urine, but male cats, when they're marking their territory, Spray a concentrated urine to fend off other male cats and- Oh, good thing I'm a woman. Besides, that just seems like a lot of setup for something that takes less than a second. Well, we know Kyle won't try anything. Just saying, I'm sure he remembers my future self and me. Kenny already has. And per the boys- Kenny, all you did after the cat peed in your face was start running around in circles cheering. Yeah, and then he ran through town screaming and started tearing off all your clothes. Plus, he also reenacted an 80s movie in his head. Which, I only know that movie exists because of this episode. But forget about that little tidbit. Gerald is at home one day when he sees a news broadcast about cheesing and calls over Sheila. It's the newest drug craze, and it's killing your kids! Killing our kids? 
Oh my god, Sheila, come look at this! This whole reaction will make sense later. However, rather than just sitting down their children, or at least Kyle, because he's old enough, and having a talk about why you shouldn't cheese, Gerald instead instills paranoia into the rest of the townsfolk. And petitions for a bill, I feel, would probably get knocked down in a court of law. Alright, we're all sufficiently scared, Gerald, but what can we do? I have written up a bill that would make having a cat illegal in the city of South Park. Okay, maybe he and Sheila were made for each other, forcing their views on the rest of the town. Gotta say, at least Gerald is much better at it than his own wife, either because his lawyer training taught him about logos, pathos, ethos, or because he's generally more liked in the community, so they don't see him as a chicken little. To help Kenny, Kyle takes one of the cats that he's been abusing and hides him at his house. We gotta keep this away from him. Oh, poor comrade. Wait, comrade? What am I saying? <laughs> Kyle keeps the cat in his sock drawer, rather than leave it in Cartman's attic. Just curious how he's feeding that cat and cleaning up after it. You know that cats are anxious creatures, especially when they're in new houses. Plus, he also forgot his mother does his laundry. Oh my god! Kyle, why did you let this random cat leave crap in your dresser? Don't you know how long it's gonna take to clean that? And the fact you can get diseases from it? Gerald and Sheila refuse to listen to Kyle's pleas about how he did not use a cat in a certain manner, and ground him for attempting to be honest. Get up to your room right now, and tell your mother and I figure out how to deal with this! Dad, will you just listen to me for a second? Now, Kyle! God! Well, some parents you are. Gerald decides to take the cat away to the police, but jumps quicker off the wagon than Stefan does around blood. I've been clean for ten years. I haven't even been near a cat, and I knew Kyle would have the same sickness as I used to have. As it turns out, Gerald has been so serious about putting down cheesing because he used to cheese. He's a ripper! I'll just do it one more time. One last time. Then I'll call the police, have them pick up the cat. And then I'll never do it again. <gasps> you stole my drugs, you B-word! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! Gerald gets back on the wagon like he never left. Hey, everybody! Good to see you again! Aw, oh, that's weirdly sad. But Gerald really peaked in his drug dream world. Unfortunately, because of his stupid law, only he and Kenny are the ones cheesing. Which I do have to applaud him for being that far reaching. Hey, that rhymes. Not even a black market cheesing ring came up. There is another suitor. What? Get out of here, kid! During their combined dream, how? They must fight to the death for the right to do nasty stuff to a rotoscoped imaginary girl. In real life, their fight looks like this. Dad, what the hell are you doing? They've been going at it for a good 30 minutes. I think this is like the only time we ever see Gerald without his yarmulke, which makes me wonder if he really does wear it as a sign of religious devotion or to cover up his bald spot or maybe some weird combo of both. Gerald? Ooh, you're in trouble. Like most disgraced politicians and or political figures, Gerald has to hold a press conference to talk about his hypocrisy. I would like to address a personal matter. I have let myself down. And I would first like to apologize to my lovely wife. Don't touch me. What is this a reference to? I feel like it's a reference to something that happened, but maybe I'm too young to get it. Still, Gerald realizes that banning cheesing did nothing to actually solve the root of the problem. Because now it's only a problem because it affects him. Cats aren't the problem. We made cats illegal, and then I cheesed for the first time in 10 years. Well, he really is a politician. Gerald decides to instead revoke the law he helped to pass. To much fanfare. It's time to legalize cats! Yeah! Hooray for Gerald! Let's hear it for Gerald! 
Thankfully, we get human scent iPad to balance things out. Kyle doesn't read the terms and agreement from Apple. Idiot, I know. And he ends up getting examined by Apple for harvesting. When you downloaded the last iTunes update, a window on your screen popped up and asked you if you agreed to our terms and conditions. You clicked agree. I'm not going with you. You've agreed to all of this! The first person Kyle decides to run and hide with is Gerald. Likely because he needs a lawyer, but also just as likely because he's a scared little kid who just wants his father. Dad! Dad, I need a lawyer! Kyle, what are you doing here? Like every three weeks, how can they know if Calm I- Calm down, Kyle, it's okay. You're safe with daddy. Huh. Too bad Gerald doesn't understand what's going on because he's a pleb. Apple's inner workings are top secret to all users. You know how it is. No, I don't know how it is. I use a PC. <laughs> what? Only good thing about you is you don't have to buy a stupid adapter whenever you go to conventions. Other than that, you suck, boomer. However, to get Kyle back, Gerald sits through a meeting with the Apple geniuses. The geniuses do not like those who waste their time. Hi, my name is Leslie. I'll be your genius. Which I can tell you from experience is a major patience tester. He goes through all of the necessary sci-fi bureaucracy because there's no way in heck he's getting only store credit. He's getting his son back, safe and sound. Eventually, he ends up having to join Apple. But if you join, we can make your son's account into a family account, and then you have to I approve all his agreements. All right, fine. I'll sign up with Apple. Ooh, Leslie, do your thing, girl. Kali fee! Better yet, Gerald is able to use his newfound Apple membership to talk down Steve Jobs. Not only to get his son back, but to make sure that nobody else's son will be forced to become another segment of the human scent iPad. I've done so much for the world. You have helped connect everyone to each other. This is the future. But can't we just slow down and enjoy the present? Still, we should probably talk about Gerald's relationship with Ike, his adopted son, because we got some stuff to unpack. While they normally have a good relationship, there are a few specific details we're gonna have to discuss. In Dead Celebrities, Gerald is going at it with Sheila when Ike is in their doorway. What the? Ike! Ike, get back to bed right now! He didn't think to close the door, or at least lock it, especially since he implies this isn't the first time Ike has done such a thing. Oh, not this again. Ike, like most toddlers, has had a nightmare. And, like, a great daddy, Gerald tells Ike to put an egg in his footy and beat it. Aw, oh, thank you for that joke, glove and boots. Ike, we are sick of you talking about ghosts! But, Daddy, I saw the- No buts! Get back to your room right now and don't come out! You got it? Really, it's more than a nightmare. Ike is having visions of dead celebrities. And this was 2009, so he's seeing a ton of them. Hi, Billy Mays here for Mega Scrub Cleanser. Rather than get his son actual help, he and Sheila Forster all of the responsibility onto Kyle and his friends. Wait. Then there's insecurity, an episode I've wanted to get to for the longest time. It's weird, I've been reviewing South Park for well over a year, and this is one of those episodes that I still haven't gotten to. Think of it like dead celebrities, but what an epilogue. One night, Sheila and Gerald are watching TV when the Cialis commercial comes on. Fake it with Cialis. It won't make her any hotter, but it'll make you not care for up to three hours. And then you can still have your own separate bathtub from her later on. Do they still air that? Just asking. My mind is stuck on the Cologar commercials and sometimes the Ozempic commercials. This commercial excites Gerald and Sheila agrees to Gerald's proposal to... Look, why don't I just show you it's easier? Oh, hello. UPS, ma'am. I have a package from Amazon for you. Oh, dear. <sighs> This leads to them doing stuff, and Ike is once again there to see it. And viewers, look, I will censor the site to protect you and your eyeballs. Or, if you're blind or can't see that well, your eardrums. 
Do it harder, you BS man! Seriously, dude, lock your freaking door! Or at least close it. You live in a house with two young children who I'm sure don't want to see you porking their mother. And don't assume, oh, they're asleep. They're not. If you assume it, they're not. Or maybe they are asleep and the thumping will wake them up. You Bambi rabbit. As we saw in Dead Celebrities, this isn't the first time they've done it. They also did it in season 20. The one season I'm not really allowed to mention. Ew, awful. But I gotta say, at least they managed to keep that spark alive all these years by doing new stuff. In a way, it's kind of sweet. This scene traumatizes Ike, who doesn't understand the context. It assumes his mommy was cheating on his daddy with the UPS man. Wait, what? Wouldn't it be the Amazon man? Because she buys all that stuff from Amazon. All I know is Ike was probably super happy when Amazon pivoted to contactless delivery. Ike cries all day and eventually confesses to Kyle what he saw. But because he's too sad, he draws it out. And without context, it of course looks like Sheila was cheating on Gerald. Uh, Ike, this is a big deal. You have to be absolutely 100%. I saw them, Kyle! I saw them! <laughs> Too bad Kyle couldn't just directly confront his mother or father, or both, which would have solved a lot of problems. First, he has to talk it out with his buttsies. Yeah, dude, like, full on. I saw everything. It totally makes sense now. My mom's been ordering all kinds of stuff from Amazon lately. Oh. Randy overhears part of the conversation and talks to his other dad friends about what steps they should take next. Do we tell Gerald or do we just stay out of it? How do you tell him? Which just makes it all the more worse. Oh, come on. He can't be trying that with all our wives. Wouldn't be the first time. They are overheard by an old guy, who I'm not sure is actually named yet, so I'm gonna call Jonathan, because to me, he just seems so much like a Jonathan. You know what? I'm gonna Google. Okay, according to the South Park wiki, he still doesn't have a name. So, yes, he's going to be Jonathan. Jonathan tells the dads that the Amazon delivery man is just the milkman from long since past, reincarnated. Wait. Or milkman a thing? Used to be. A man had to go to the store to buy himself a pitcher of milk. Men got lazy. They wanted that milk delivered right to the door. Think of him like how Candyman is just Bloody Mary, but with bees. The milkman boned all of their wives, just as the Amazon man is likely doing to their wives. As Jonathan regales them. That's when we jumped him. It was over in minutes. Then we burned his body. Wait a second, this paints a horrible implication. We know that the UPS man isn't really doing stuff to their wives. Or to Steve and Chris. And then I remembered, I had ordered it. I ordered it the day before and I barely had any recollection. And because of the parallels Jonathan keeps making, does this mean the milkman was actually innocent? Was one of their buddies just role-playing with his wife and everybody took it the wrong way? If so, holy crap, that is freaking cruel. I need a joke to take my mind off the fact they bludgeoned somebody who probably didn't deserve it. You want that milk pasteurized? And the blonde replied, No, just up to my boobs. I can splash it in my eyes. You know, I just got that joke, and I've watched this episode for almost 10 years, if not more. According to Jonathan, the only way to make sure the milkman can't continue his tirade, tirade, is to kick the stuffing out of him. And then you gotta go to the store for your stuff from then on. Ugh, I've been spoiled by Dash Mart, and living within quick walking distance of two supermarkets. So the fathers do the sensible thing, and rather than just point blank ask this dude if he is sleeping around with their wives, they lay a trap. You should have never come to our town. A man's wife is his life, Mr. UPS Man. They homage Bane because the UPS Man is the bane of their existence. Thought we wouldn't find out? <laughs>
Gerald, I hope you're happy. You could have just locked the door and given you and your wife some privacy, but no, you couldn't do that because, I don't know, I guess you're selfish. All I know is that much like Clyde, the blood is on your rascal. Eventually, Kyle works up the nerve to hold an intervention for his parents. Mom, Dad, you've always taught me that being direct and honest is a basic Jewish tenet. That's right, Kyle. That probably would have worked out well in season 20. So, here we all are. Mom, do you want to tell Dad something? OMG, this is so awkward. Not even for Gerald and Sheila, who likely are kind of realizing that Kyle or Ike saw it, but just think of it from the UPS guy's perspective. I hate this damn town! Every day, things just keep getting weirder around here, and I'm just about sick of it! Ah! Unfortunately, the fathers are still trying to beat the ever-loving crap out of this poor sap, and his insecurity is going off the charts. Somebody answer me! You have to send help now! Sir, we are sending help. Just stay calm. Hang on, sir. Because of the stress, he ends up committing a job hair. You come down here! Too bad nobody cares. Hey, that rhymes. So you say this man killed himself because he was a psychopath who was forced to have sex with his mother? Yes, we found that in his pocket. Thankfully, Gerald and Sheila managed to clear up the misconception, especially after the police root through their closet. Sometimes when people get older, they need to play and pretend to keep things interesting. It's just a way I can still be intimate with your mother. But I guess thank you for your candor, Gerald. Thank you so much. However, that's not to say Gerald is beyond helping. There is one later season episode that sort of redeemed him, if only a teeny tiny bit. Help, my teenager hates me. Wow, another episode I have yet to discuss. Mostly because I dislike it. Not that I have any problems with it, I just, it's not my cup of tea. Kyle and his friends have started playing Airsoft and Kyle includes his father, so he can buy him stuff. In our soft field, everybody plays on teams and I promise I'll take good care of the equipment. And if you think about it, it's really a great hobby for team building and learning communication and- Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I mean, you gotta do something with all those lawsuits, dude. Still, it's really nice to see him have real concern for his son. Please, all my friends already bought their stuff and it's totally way for us to play outside like you always say it. Come on, please, only we can't tell mom because she won't understand, but it's totally safe because you're eye protection. Okay, okay, Kyle, breathe. Upon finding out Kyle isn't having fun because of the annoying teenagers, Gerald teams up with the other fathers, plus Jimbo, and faces the teenagers at their own game with super cool, awesome weapons. And we've got no one else to partner with. Well, did you guys ever consider your... Dads? This time, there is a happy ending. They all bond and decide to go to Cartman's house for hot dogs. We couldn't have gotten rid of the teenagers without you. Yeah, thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Hey, that's what we're here for, right? We're just glad you wanted to spend some time with us. At least until the fathers realize that one day, their sons will grow up and turn into teenagers. And there really is nothing they can do besides make the most out of the time they have together. Should I take them out now? Not yet. We still have a few good years before they turn into monsters. And that's Gerald Proflosky. I think you can see why I dislike the Troll Trace arc so immensely. It ruined a perfectly good thing. While Gerald wasn't always a saint, he was still a character. A super interesting one. He had a lot of great episodes and moments. And excluding the moments I listed, he was primarily a very good father. I do still hate Troll Trace for what it did to him, and I hope down the line he gets to do more good. But if I know Knew what I know now. I would bright the highs and cherish the lows, just as I'm doing. Because before they lower the curtain, you should be certain to enjoy the show. That's what I know. Um, I guess, uh, bye. They'll never be able to hurt you again. Cool, thanks. All right, folks, our work here is done. 